What's up guys, this is Dr. Webb here. Thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week, you don't wanna miss them. In this video today, we're going to be reacting to a TV series, it's called Chicago Med. I found a spine case that I wanted to give my reactions to as a spine surgeon, and we're going to jump right into the video and give you my thoughts. Is it really how it is in the hospital? Are these conditions actually real? Do these surgeons, are they doing the right thing? We're gonna jump right into it. Let's go. Jordy Collins, 16 year old male with Down syndrome, motor vehicle collision. We're going to Baghdad. Is it okay if I take your pulse? Yeah. I'm his dad, we were rear ended. We were going to the ring. I think he got whiplash. I ice skate. That's really cool. I can't ice skate to save my life. <laughs> Doris? One of the first things we do when a patient comes into the ER, into what it's, it's called our trauma bay, is just the area of the emergency room that the trauma patients go to, is we check their airway. One of the most important things is that they're breathing. This patient is actually talking to us, so it's actually a good thing that he is talking. That means his airway is open. All right, I'm Mike Khan. One, two, three. A big hospital. Sure is. We're going to take good care Usually of you. There's someone at the head of the bed. You can see in the video that there are people on both sides of the patient. He has a C collar on, which is common in a trauma situation until we rule out an injury to the spine. Usually there's a person at the head of the bed holding the patient's head in line with their body so that there is no injury that is sustained during the movement because if a patient has a spinal cord injury or an injury to their neck or their back, you wanna hold that in place so that the spinal cord is not damaged when the patient is moved from the stretcher to the bed. We're gonna take good care of you. Jordy, anything else bothering you besides your neck? Uh-uh. Good. Chest x-ray? Dad, anything in Jordy's history we should know about? No, he's a healthy kid. I'd like to hear that. I thought that was quite strange that the dad didn't mention that the patient had Down syndrome. Maybe it was just implied by looking at him, or maybe the dad didn't think that was something important. But when a patient comes into the hospital, it's important to let the doctors know about any potential past medical history. Down syndrome is really important to know because of some things that it can cause, and we're going to talk about those. Hey, I'm going to listen to your heart. Yeah, Jordy, your heart sounds real good. Squeeze my hand, would you? Whew, you're strong. <laughs> when we have patients squeeze our hands or actually try to move their fingers and wrists and arms, we're checking for function of the cervical spine. That lets us know that the cervical spine is functioning well. If the patient can't grip my hands really well or has weakness on one side of their body, that could mean there's an injury either in the brain or the neck. This is a big camera, it's gonna take a picture of you, it won't hurt a bit. Okay, everybody clear? Coming up. Your chest looks good too. Usually we get a chest x-ray and also a x-ray of the belly. Those are two important x-rays that are first given to everyone in the trauma bay if they come in for a particular trauma. In this case, I thought the healthcare workers were a little bit too close to the x-ray machine. There's radiation that is exposed, and most people would step away about five to six feet to avoid and minimize x-ray exposure. So this doctor who is standing that close to the x-ray machine is probably getting too much exposure to radiation, which is a bad thing. He should be either wearing a lead vest and a thyroid shield to minimize the x-ray exposure or step away. I'm gonna take this collar off and see what's what, okay? Okay. All right. Ow! Sorry, buddy. I'm gonna put that collar back on. You know, so he was having some pain at the posterior portion of his neck back here. That's not a good thing. Whenever a patient has pain at the neck, that is a indication to get further imaging, like a CAT scan or a MRI or X-ray. Sure, there aren't any other injuries. With your permission, I'd like to send Jordy for a CT of his head and neck. Hey there, Jordy. Good news. CT scan is normal. 
Can I go skate now? Jordy competes. Special Olympics. Wow. Well, maybe you can go skate. Tell me, how you feeling? Real good. Hands feel funny. What? Tingly. Really? Both hands? Uh-huh. What does that mean? Not sure. Whenever a patient in a trauma situation reports numbness and tingling in their fingers, that's usually a sign that there is some injury to the spinal cord. It could come from a lot of other different regions, such as your shoulder, pulling on your brachial plexus, having an injury to your elbow here, injuring the nerve here, or something more distally. But when someone reports that they have numbness and tingling and problems with their fingers, I automatically think of the spine. In that instance, I'm taking that patient to the MRI scanner to get an MRI to see and evaluate what's going on with the spinal cord. You feel that? Uh-uh. Squeeze my hand. Not so strong now, huh? No. Right now, he's testing his sensation. You can use anything that's kind of sharp or dull to test the proprioception, which is the finger in position of space or the toe in position of space and also you can check their sensory level if a patient can't feel their thumb or their index finger that tells me that there may be some injury to the spinal cord that controls the c6 level or c7 level if they have numbness or tingling in these two fingers and digits four and five that can indicate something a little bit lower in the spinal cord maybe it's c7 or c8 so the different parts of the body can usually indicate what portion of the spinal cord may be injured. There you go. It's another type of scan called an MRI. Dad? Okay. Don't worry, Dad. I'll be okay. You're a champ. I'll, uh, I'm gonna put that order in. Okay. Whenever a patient comes into the ER or trauma bay with an injury to their spinal cord, the ER doctor will then consult the neurosurgeons or the orthopedic spine surgeons. So what is the difference between a neurosurgeon and an orthopedic spine surgeon? Both surgeons actually perform spine surgery. Neurosurgeons go through training, they perform surgery and learn how to perform surgery on the brain as well as the spine. Orthopedic spine surgeons usually undergo training in orthopedics. We learn how to do knee replacements, hip replacements, hand surgery, how to perform surgery on different joints and musculoskeletal issues. Then one who completes their orthopedic surgery training can then do a fellowship in spine surgery. Some neurosurgeons perform spine surgery plus brain surgery. Other neurosurgeons focus exclusively on the spine. And generally, orthopedic spine surgeons focus exclusively on the spine but you do have some orthopedic spine surgeons that still do knee replacements and hip replacements, take trauma call and fix patients who have tibia fractures or femur fractures. So it just depends on the practice setting that that particular surgeon is in. In a lot of hospitals, as well as practices around the US, a lot of neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons work together to take care of patients with spinal pathology. Jordy, Russell, this is Dr. Abrams, our chief of neurosurgery. Hi. Jordy, your, uh, your MRI revealed a condition called atlantoaxial instability. Atlantoaxial instability is when the top two vertebrae in your spine become unstable. If we look at a model here, this is the back of the skull here, and this is the cervical vertebrae. You have seven of them. C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. The top two vertebrae here is the condition called atlantoaxial instability. Usually in patients with Down syndrome or rheumatoid arthritis, you can have some instability of these two bones here where it causes these two bones to shift upon one another. When that happens, right in the center of those two bones is the spinal cord. The spinal cord can become compressed, it can become injured because of the continued motion between those two bones there. Atlantoaxial instability. It is just a name referring to the two top vertebrae in the cervical spine that can become unstable in certain conditions. 
Yeah, what it means is that your spine is built a little differently and working not quite the way it should. Yeah, we've seen it in about 25% of DS patients. I know. Um, is there a, a way to treat it? Why don't we talk outside? Hey, Jordy, buddy. We're right back, okay? Okay. okay. This allantoaxial instability can cause a lot of issues in the spine. It can cause clumsiness in the hands, numbness and tingling, problems with the patient's gait, problems with their bowel or bladder. And if the cervical spine is too unstable and causing symptoms, this is when surgery is indicated. So there are two options. First, I can surgically repair the instability, but it's an invasive high-risk surgery. It could fix the problem or it could make things worse. Severely limit Jordy's range of motion. And then the second option? Stabilize the spine with a halo vest, type of brace, wait for the whiplash to heal. It's a much safer route, and that's what I'd recommend. So the two options that he gave them are pretty realistic. One option is when we can go in and put screws and rods into those little bones in the back of the neck and fuse that area so it doesn't move upon one another and kind of stabilize that area or a halo vest. And this is a big metal kind of object that goes on top of the head here and then goes on top of the shoulders to kind of stabilize the neck so it doesn't move much more. Jordy's congenital, so eventually Jordy's gonna need the surgery. Right, but it is possible to put it off for years. I don't want that, I want them to fix me. He wants the operation. I want to skate, show him, show him me. Jordy. Show him me. Show me the video of Jordy skating. I can fly, you'll see. Look, I'll, I'll afford it to you. I can fly. Jordy, okay? There are other things that you can do. You will find something else that you love no. to I want to fly. I want to be free. This is my fault. I was always compensating for having a kid with downs. I just wanted to have a regular boy. So I pushed him into sports. Maybe he did. But he loves that usually sport. Usually patients with Down syndrome, they're usually screened before any type of physical activity or sports. And the way we do this is with x-rays. On a lateral view or looking at it from the side, we look at the top two vertebrae to see if there is any type of movement or displacement. If there is, usually these patients are restricted from playing any physical activity or sports because of the risk of injury to the spinal cord. Jordy's the most important thing in my life. He's the best thing in my life. I can't do anything that would cause him harm. I get it. I'm the one who told you this was a safer option, and I certainly understand your fears. But maybe this isn't about you. Maybe it's about Jordy and what he wants. Dad? So, are you gonna go fix me? Yes, I am. Yeah, you're gonna go to sleep, and when you wake up, everything's gonna be okay. Okay. Jordy should be back in the ice very soon. <sighs> oh my God. Let me know when he's competing. I'd like to come. I will. That neurosurgeon is pretty Thank stern you. and pretty uh, straightforward. It looks like he doesn't laugh much. Come on, man. You got to have some sense of humor uh, when dealing with situations like this. Uh, at least smile or have some type of uh, reaction to what's going on. Uh, he's, he's a little weird to me. Looks like Jordy gets to keep flying. If it hadn't been for you, so this was pretty realistic when the patient came into the er he had a c collar on the er doctor got x-rays and then a ct scan and then a mri of his neck and showed that he had atlantoaxial instability this is pretty common in patients with down syndrome usually when patients are symptomatic which means they have symptoms numbness and tingling clumsiness in their hands, problems with their gait or balance, bowel or bladder. This is when surgery is indicated. And then we go in, make an incision on the posterior portion of the neck here. We put screws and hardware into those little bones and the C1 as well as C2 to stabilize that area and fuse that area. 
usually patients who are symptomatic from their C1, C2 instability are restricted from playing sports. So when the surgeon said, hey, let me know when he competes again, I'd like to be there, that is not really realistic just because we hold these patients from sports or from a lot of physical activity because of the instability of their spine and even after spine surgery. So pretty realistic uh, case here on Chicago Meds. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys would like more reactions to different TV shows and different medical drama series, put it in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. This is Dr. Webb. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. We'll see you next time.